Hey, this is Mike with Neurology. Okay, got a consult. All right, for Tremor. Um, where are you guys calling from? Okay, you're up in the epilepsy monitoring unit. Okay, cool. I should be, actually be able to pull you up here on the video um, and take a, just a quick look before I run up there, okay? <laughs> Movements! Welcome back guys. Today we're going to be briefly discussing abnormal movements. How do we accurately describe them to our colleagues and then how do we go on to accurately define them as well. So we're not going to be discussing movement disorders, syndromes, stuff like that. We're just going to be talking about the movements themselves, how do we talk about them, and how do we define them. Um, so it looks like rest tremor. Myoclonus? That's definitely Korea. Atheotosis. <coughs> Kinetic tremor. <coughs> Before we jump in and go look at the real videos, let's talk about first how we're going to describe these movements. Even if we're not entirely sure what they are, we should still be able to accurately describe them well. So we're going to assume that all of these are essentially involuntary. So our first major branch point is saying whether or not this movement is rhythmic or non-rhythmic. Is it sort of jerky and erratic, or does it have a rhythm to it? So if it's rhythmic, we then go on to say, what is the frequency? Is it fast? Is it slow? And what is the amplitude? Is it a big amplitude or a small amplitude? And then finally, some statement about the scenario. So is it produced at rest or with a certain type of movement, task, or position? If it's non-rhythmic, the first thing we want to observe is, is it stereotypic or not? Does it involve only one muscle group or one limb, or can it sort of generalize and involve other limbs? Next, we want to also take a look at the amplitude, how big are these movements, and finally comment on the quickness of it. Is it a really fast movement, or is it a little bit slower, but still large amplitude? For both of these two major categories of rhythmic or non-rhythmic, we obviously want to sum up with what body part is affected, and is a unilateral or bilateral. Now let's talk about definitions. First we'll talk about rhythmic movements. So one of the first ones I want to discuss is a dystonic tremor. Most frequently you see a dystonic tremor in the head as sort of a no-no tremor. And it's really the effect of agonist and antagonist muscles sort of pulling to realign the head against the spastic muscle, or the dystonic muscle, I should say. Frequently with this type of a tremor, you can have a patient who finds a null point, meaning a position where they have equal opposing muscles that sort of cancel out the tremor. Um, dystonic tremors in general or dystonia, you can also discuss if they have a sensory trick uh, where they can maybe touch their chin and make the tremor go away. Next is atheotosis, uh, which is most frequently described in the fingers as sort of a writhing, snake-like movement, uh, but can be rhythmic. And then finally, tremor, which will break down into rest tremor and kinetic tremor. I think rest tremor is pretty straightforward. Um, it's usually a tremor that's brought on at rest. Sometimes you need to actually distract the patient a little bit by having them count the months of the year backwards or do an activity with the other hand, something like that. Next is kinetic, which we can break down into postural, um, which in a certain posture we produce a tremor. Simple tremor, where the tremor is present throughout all phases of movement and positions. Intention tremor, which is really just a form of cerebellar ataxia. And then finally, task-specific tremor, so writer's cramp, for example. Now the other major category is the non-rhythmic abnormal movements. First, let's talk about myoclonus. Myoclonus is a sudden, brief sort of shock-like movement. It's probably the fastest of all the non-rhythmic movements. It can be positive phenomena, it can be quite large in amplitude sometimes, or a little bit more subtle. Um, there can be negative components as well. Uh, frequently you can have patients with outstretched hands dropping or losing tone. That's negative myoclonus, otherwise known as asterixis, which is seen in things like hepatic encephalopathy or uremia. Next is chorea, which is classically thought of as a dance-like movement. I think the best way to describe it is uh, still an abrupt onset, but sort of a continuous flow that's not necessarily stereotyped in nature and not as quick as some of the other movements. Ballism is somewhat similar to chorea, only in that it's a larger amplitude movement. 
but it's frequently a much faster movement and a very large amplitude. So it's fast, it's ballistic. Um, it can be stereotyped uh, in cases of hemibolismus where only one side of the body is affected. And then finally, we do need to mention tics. The keyword with tics is stereotyped. Um, the other key word to remember with tics is that they are suppressible, but usually at the cost of some inner anxiety or pressure to move. Now that we've covered all the definitions, I want to quickly mention some of the exam maneuvers we need to be checking, especially with the more rhythmic movements, specifically tremors. One thing you'd ideally like to do is see the hands at rest, usually kind of over the knees, um, hanging down. Sometimes you need to have the patient close their eyes count the months of the year backwards before you'll produce a tremor, if it's a rest tremor. Sometimes you need to distract them by having them do an activity with the other limb to bring out a rest tremor. You'd also like to have them go finger to nose testing. That can bring out a kinetic tremor in general and help you differentiate between a simple tremor, like essential tremor, versus an intention tremor like cerebellar ataxia. You want to assess both of the extremities that are affected, specifically we're talking about the upper extremities here, in multiple different positions to see if there's a positional component. You can also have them perform tasks specifically based on cues that you're getting from the history. So if they're telling them that their tremor is giving them great difficulty eating soups, drinking water, you can test that by giving them a glass, doesn't have to be filled with water, um, but it could be a water bottle filled with water, and just asking them to reach out, grab the cup from you, pretend to take a drink, and then pass it back. Sometimes you can bring out um, a task-specific tremor there, or a simple tremor as well. And then lastly, something you can do to quickly distinguish between a kinetic tremor and a rest tremor is perform the Archimedes spiral. Archimedes spiral, you need to coach them not to rest the palm of their hand on the sheet of paper or even their finger, only the tip of the pen can touch. And they will draw a large spiral like this with both hands, right and left. Sometimes on the first try you won't get anything, so what I frequently do is have them draw a spiral within the spiral, and then sometimes this is when you will bring out that kinetic tremor. So this Archimedes spiral is going to be consistent with a rest tremor, whereas something like this is going to be consistent with a kinetic tremor. Alright, now let's jump into the videos. Here goes our first video. So you can right away see that there's a little bit of a postural component there in the right hand. Looks to be rhythmic, it's high frequency, low amplitude. Here he is drawing the Archimedes spiral, and he's really struggling there with his left hand. So what's interesting about this person here is that you can see he's got a pretty severe kinetic tremor, and it looks like he's adapted quite a bit by making quick pen strokes with each letter. This is probably the only way this guy can sign checks. And then lastly, we've got arms outstretched. He's got a pretty bad postural slash kinetic tremor there, worse on left than right. So to sum things up in this video, this is an involuntary rhythmic tremor. It's a high frequency, low amplitude, seems to be postural, but also seems to be kinetic. More specifically, there's a simple and postural component as well, and it's worse on left than right. So this is probably essential tremor. Next video, so I see definitely a tremor at rest, it's rhythmic, it looks like it's high frequency, lowish amplitude, and when she outstretches her hands, it completely abolishes it, just confirming that this is probably a rest tremor of her left hand. Okay, next video, so this does not seem to be too rhythmic, but I can't say that it's stereotyped, this sort of backwards head thrusting over and over again. And really the key to this case is just getting extra history, probably talking to this kid and seeing if he could potentially suppress it and if he feels this inner drive to perform that movement to get that release. So this is a tick. All right, next video. So I don't see anything at rest. Right away, this is non-rhythmic, so that throws us into the non-rhythmic category. It's sort of quick, jerky movements, really quick, smallish amplitude. It's bilateral. And there seems like mostly a negative component to me, like loss of tone. So this is a classic example of negative myoclonus, specifically asterixis. This patient probably is suffering from hepatic encephalopathy or uremia, something like that. I'll be honest with you, I found it pretty difficult to find good videos of myoclonus um, on the internet. So we're going to have to kind of skip over that one for now. Okay, let's describe what we see. Okay, right off the bat, non-rhythmic. 
non-stereotypes, multiple muscle groups, it's slow, it's sort of a high-ish amplitude. So again, a little bit of history would help with context here. Um, and also, this isn't one we talked about, but this is dyskinesia. So specifically, this lady suffers from idiopathic Parkinson's disease, and dyskinesia is not a consequence of Parkinson's itself, but it is a consequence of overtreatment, typically with dopaminergic medications. Next video! Right off the bat, non-rhythmic, non-stereotype, multiple muscle groups, it's high amplitude, fairly quick and jerky for how high of an amplitude we're seeing here. So this is bolismus. Okay, next video. This is non-rhythmic. Um, this one has more of a sidedness to it. It's right side of the body. Fairly high amplitude. It's quite quick. It's not very continuous per se. Um, so the difficulty here is saying whether or not this is chorea versus bolismus. Based on the, the quickness of the movements, this is most likely hemibalism. Okay, so we have a lady with an outstretched right hand. Um, you could argue that this is somewhere on the spectrum of rhythmic and non-rhythmic. And there's sort of a writhing, snake-like nature to it. So straight away, we can just skip to saying this is most likely atheotosis. Okay, this is our last video. It's a bit of a puzzler. Let's jump in. So right off the bat, it seems like it's somewhat rhythmic in nature. It's a high frequency, low amplitude. So this is some form of a tremor. It seems to be present both at rest and when she lifts up her hand in on activity. So here's gonna be our giveaway. So they're gonna ask her to perform a task with her other hand and look, it breaks the tremor, completely goes away, and she actually can't maintain the rhythmicity of it. And then we also see here, there's actually a change in the axis. So it seemed to be primarily in the Y axis and then for a minute it switched to the X. Most tremors don't change axes like that. So based on what you guys are seeing right now, um, you're probably thinking that this doesn't fit into any category that we've talked about. That's because this is a psychogenic tremor, which is something that you're going to have to know how to see um, and differentiate. All right, and before we go, I just want to make a quick recommendation for a sci-fi book. Books are fun. Books are great. Is it book time yet? Oh, I just can't wait. I'm really into sci-fi, specifically cold sci-fi. Um, however, there is a book that I read somewhat recently. It's called Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. It was fantastic. So in brief, the premise of this book is that mankind needs to colonize another world. However, we're never gonna break the speed of light. So in this universe, the only feasible way to get there is on board what's called a generation ship. Essentially a ship that travels somewhat near the speed of light, but still would take many, 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 many hundreds and hundreds of years to get to the final destination. So multiple generations of humans need to live and die aboard this ship before they ever reach their destination. So the cool thing about this book is you jump in right in the middle of the trip. So you have a generation that's never known anything except for the inside of this gigantic spaceship. This book is loaded with big ideas. It's very character driven. Um, and I really don't want to ruin it for anybody by talking about it anymore. I would just recommend if you have some time to do some fun reading, go out and pick this one up. Link in the description below. No! So that's it for today. If you guys enjoyed this video or found it helpful in any way, please do me a favor and leave a like and also subscribe, especially if you want to stay on top of any new content I'm putting out. I'll catch you guys later.